What are modern, fast-growing companies doing to attract and hire top talent? How can your company utilize cutting-edge techniques and technology to drive long-term, repeatable results? Welcome to the Growth Recruiting Podcast, where we answer these questions and many more through conversations with top CEOs, leaders in talent acquisition, and pioneers in HR. Here's your host, Josh Tolan. Today, I am joined by Brad Wilkins, the Vice President of Human Resources at Altasource, which is an integrated service provider and marketplace for the real estate and mortgage industries. Before we get started, a few things to know about Brad. He was named a top 25 HR executive under 40 by Workforce Magazine and the number one corporate recruiter in America by TheLadders.com. He has been featured speaker for LinkedIn, The Ladders, Workforce Live, TLNT, and more. So I am really excited to have Brad on the podcast today, and I know he'll provide some awesome tips for all of you that are listening. Brad, how's it going? Hey, Josh. It's uh, my pleasure. Uh, The the, the thing you didn't tell him is that uh, I've I've been using your platform probably since almost the beginning of of your guys' induction, and I've been a big fan of your guys' work, so it's a pleasure to to join the podcast. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate the shout-out there. Yeah, we go way back, so I definitely know a lot about all of your great recruiting experience. I know you'll be able to bring some awesome tips to the show today. So I guess real quickly, I know I gave you a little bit of an intro, but maybe you could introduce yourself a little bit more, talk about your current role, your current company, and what you guys are up to. Sure. So uh, Altasource is in a really unique juxtaposition as as the VP of HR, although uh, by the time you listen to this, uh, we may have launched out our rebranding. We're uh, launching as People Solutions. Uh, next year, and with the kind of catchphrase that we're solving business problems with people solutions. Uh, so depending on when you listen to this, the VP of HR might not be the accurate title. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, the company is really cool because we've got a, a combination of some really mature businesses that are, you know, multi-million, hundreds of millions of dollars, annual revenue, uh, you know, serving kind of the top 10 banks in America uh, with their servicing needs on the mortgage side, as well as a lot of the mid-market originators in the loan space. Uh, in fact, 15% of loans across the country every year go through all the source in some way. Uh, so it's a, a really mature mortgage business. And then on our real estate side, we have a number of initiatives that are kind of growth initiatives, you know, really incubation style. Uh, one of those being owners.com, uh, which is a marketplace to buy and sell real estate, uh, an online platform uh, that's got a brokerage built in that, you know, really is in massive expansion mode, just hired a new president about six months ago. Uh, and then we have another business, uh, a real estate investment function uh, that's doing a lot of things that, frankly, I can't even talk about on this podcast, but uh, mm-hmm. hopefully, again, by the time it comes out, you'll, uh, you'll get to hear about uh, that's also in major, major growth mode. Uh, and so really, really, both of those are, are at completely different juxtapositions than the mature businesses. And so it's balancing out some of these mature along with a, uh, a growing internal technology group uh, that's servicing and, and kind of trying to find where there are opportunities for automation. Etc. Uh, so we've got a mature, big, global, you know, 6,000 employees in India, almost 1,000 in the Philippines, uh, 2,000 in the United States, uh, and then spread out through Luxembourg, Uruguay, uh, Romania, etc. So global, fast-growing, uh, but also stabilized <laughs> mature businesses and uh, in a very, very interesting industry at, at this time of the world right now. Wow. That's, that's pretty crazy. So that's pretty cool because it sounds like you're pretty much in charge of the recruiting and human resources on a global enterprise scale, but also it's almost like you guys have these startups underneath the umbrella. So it's, it's a balancing act between <laughs> recruiting and managing human resources for a company that's new and growing like crazy and has a whole lot of people coming on board versus you know, a huge global organization. Absolutely. In fact, one of the interesting challenges and the reason they brought me on with my background was they were going through massive hyper growth, was the fastest growing stock on NASDAQ two years in a row. Uh, and during that type of growth, frankly, there were a lot of things in the HR function that you know had some patchwork or some, some pieces put together uh, that we really wanted to flesh out and then build into world-class systems and processes and, and opportunities. And so, you know, we've got the startups here today, but even the whole machine itself actually feels sometimes like a big startup in the sense that we're getting to build out and flesh out some of these world-class things uh, in a very, very modern perspective. Uh, and so that's the, uh, the interesting pers- kind of component. The clarification on my role, my role also has a, a unique twist to it. So I am uh, in charge of what we call kind of traditional human resources uh, with regards to the United States, Uruguay, and Europe, 
Uh, and then I've got a global responsibility for what I call talent management. So that's recruiting, learning, development, organiza organizational development, things of that nature. And so uh, it's, a, it's a nice juxtaposition where I've got a little bit of the classic traditional uh, kind of business partnering here uh, and then global perspective for some of the more progressive things that we're looking to do as well. Uh, yeah, so that's it, that's that's <laughs> really interesting. Yeah, that's, that's a lot on your plate, and I know you know we're going to get into a lot of that stuff here. So, with the company right now globally, I think I read is it nine thousand plus employees? How many are you guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think we're just slightly under nine thousand okay. uh, plus a, a, a large contingent of contractors and and vendors, especially like in Orange dot com, for instance. Right now, we have over three hundred real estate agents uh, that are part of our brokerage exclusively, and so you know they don't show up on the headcount report. But yeah, a little wow. under nine thousand currently. So, and how big is your team? Oh, uh, right now, and uh, I haven't counted this week yet, but uh, we're somewhere around the range of about one hundred and fifty to two hundred uh, people all in, uh, with the recruiting team actually making up a significant portion of that population. Interesting. So, yeah, we've got about we've got about ninety in India, about. 40 or so in the U.S., a little bit more. I think we've got about 10 new openings coming up in the beginning of the year. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so we're probably about 150. And we count the Philippines and Uruguay are a little smaller. Wow, wow. So what what is the structure of that team like? I'm, I'm assuming there's some people that are in charge of sourcing. It, it's You've probably got it pretty well segmented given that you have to recruit such a large volume of people. You need these people focused on specific functions within the whole recruitment life cycle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so we've got kind of – Three recruiting populations, essentially, and, and they're, they're segmented out with not too much overlap, more of a system and process overlap than a, than a leadership overlap all rolling up into me. Uh, so obviously you've got the U.S. kind of what I'll call corporate recruiting, and I'll talk about that in a second because we're doing some really interesting things there. Uh, then we have what's focused on our owners.com real estate agent recruiting team. That's by far is our biggest team. Uh, you know, It's a group that's structured in, in a very kind of traditional high-volume recruiting way. We've got a sourcing team. Uh, and then we've got kind of these roles that we call regional leads. And the sourcers are literally going out and dialing real estate agents every single day, trying to convince them to have an opportunity to join the brokerage, then sending them up to the regional lead, uh, who obviously is doing much more of an organizational development style behavioral interview, uh, assessing them, and then kind of getting them to a hiring manager, the managing broker, uh, and so kind of pushing them through that way. Uh, we're actually doing some pretty cool things in the future where we're pushing a lot of the assessment components of the real estate agent experience into training and development. Uh, so, you know, Josh, you, you know I've always been a fan of kind of capturing uh, information around the candidate during the onboarding phase. And so we're doing that here, which I've done at other places in my career as well, instead of just relying on the recruiter and the hiring manager, continuing that data loop all the way through the entire process. And so, uh, so that's the agent recruiting. And then we have the APAC cor uh, corporate recruiting team as well uh, that handles Il India and the Philippines. On the U.S. corporate team, the really cool thing that we've done, uh, and we just launched it here in the last couple of months, is you know if I, if I look at where is recruiting typically shortchanging themselves, it's about the assessment of the candidate. Uh, so you have typically recruiters whose job is to hire people, and they'll do whatever they can to get a person on board. That's the nature of a recruiter. Uh, and then you've got a hiring manager who doesn't have time, doesn't necessarily become an expert at behavioral interviewing. Uh, they trust their gut, which means they're bringing bias to the, the process, et cetera. And so you know, it's really a recipe for disaster at a lot of companies. You've got someone whose number one bias is trying to get someone hired, and another whose bias is trying to find people that they, you know, that they like almost and without any real data or validation behind it. And so the really fun thing that we did, which is very much in the spirit of you know, some of the work that I've done at previous companies as well, but I've never had the time to really flesh out like I've gotten to do here, which is we've actually inserted organizational development in the middle of the interview process. And so we have a new function called uh, a, ta a talent partner, and the talent partner is essentially a traditional kind of senior recruiter. The talent partner's job is to extract the requirements from the hiring manager. Uh, and if I look at recruiting, it's kind of got four components uh, or four steps in its journey. Step one is where you're reactive. A requisition comes in, you start working on the requisition. You know, a step below that where you're really bad is where it's retroactive. You know, a rec comes in and it's 90 days or more until you're even going to pay attention to that rec. Uh, a step above that is proactive where you start saying, oh, hey, you know, we're about to close this contract on this deal and we're going to need 10 of this role. Let me start building a, a pipeline of talent. Let me start building a social community, whatever it may be. 
so you've got retroactive, reactive, proactive. And the top level is cliche is how this where I call partnering. And where we're aspirationally going in the next year, and we'll see how it plays out, I don't know anyone who's doing this yet, is we actually want people to call our, our talent partners and not open up a requisition, but come with a business problem. Say, hey, I'd like to increase efficiency on my team 10%. What's available in this market, let's say in Atlanta, uh, efficiency 10% will yield me uh, an increased pre-tax margin of you know, $250,000. You have $250,000, go see what the market can bear. And, you know, that might be a one senior project manager to set up a PMO with two coordinators or three project managers, or it's a data analyst and a medium project manager and a coordinator. And so there's different ways of kind of slicing that business problem based on what is in real-time availability in the marketplace. Uh, so the talent partner is supposed to really kind of understand the market and the roles and the requirements of the, of the business, and so it should be solving business problems again, not necessarily just filling the requisition. Because a lot of times a manager calls and says, hey, I need to open up this role, and if you really ask them why, they say, well, that was what we had before when Bob left. <laughs> it's like, okay, Bob. Uh, you know, if Bob's gone, I'm going to replace it with the same exact person. That may not make sense because Bob's been here for six years, uh, and you haven't looked at the structure since then. And so that, that talent partner then passes the requisition and kind of key requirements. And if you look at any of our job postings, you'll notice a few unique attributes that, again, uh, anyone who's ever worked with me, they're, they're pretty distinct signatures on, on most of my job descriptions the last couple of companies I've worked at. Sure. Uh, number one is that there's a maximum of four requirements. Uh, and that's really hard for hiring managers to get into their, uh, their kind of ecosystem is, you can't tell me 20 bullets uh, because with 20 bullets, two things happen. Number one, either you end up finding someone who doesn't read the job description and they just spray and pray and apply anyway. Or number two, and this is the worst one, they actually read all those 20 bullets and like, well, I've got 18 of them, but not two. I'm not going to apply to this role. I clearly don't have the requirements they're looking for. Uh, you know, I love when companies put nice to haves. You know, <laughs> nice to have is code for don't right. bother me if you don't have these. And in fact, in a lot of their ATSs, it completely screens out even the nice to haves uh, that don't meet the requirements. And so, uh, and even a side sidebar, and that I actually just saw a study last week that uh, women, women are actually less likely to apply to a job in which they are not a 100% fit for the requirements. So we're actually getting in our own way in terms of diversity initiatives whenever you're posting 20 bullet long job descriptions. Right, the right, other exactly. Thing, yeah, the other unique thing that I've really focused a lot on is you'll notice there are no degree requirements on any of our jobs except a few accounting ones where a CPA is required or a law one where a law degree is required. But for 95% of our jobs, there are no education requirements. Uh, and also we try our best and uh, occasionally we slip through where we don't say years of experience required. So instead of saying, you know, five years of experience, well, this candidate only has four years and 11 months. They're not going to cut it. Uh, <laughs> I just, I think, oh, well, that's different, Brad. Was it, okay, was four years and 10 months okay? Well, no, it's, it's, it's about five. Four years, five months. You know, what if someone worked four years but put in 80 hours a week uh, versus someone who worked four years and put in 40 hours a week? Are those the same candidate? Is that the same four or five years? Uh, so, again, there's so many nuances to it. We're getting our own way a lot of times. And so the way that you kind of get back in the way of getting out of the way is this new role that I talked about with organizational development. We actually have IO psychologists that we've hired that are in this new function called a talent assessor. And the talent assessor really fits well, Joshua, into some of the work that you guys have done around the video interview where it's – and I've said this for a number of years now, it, it's show me instead of tell me that you can do the job. And so typically as part of our interview process, there's a, a, a couple batteries, uh, some of them very practical, uh, a knowledge check around a particular specialized area. Some of it is more, you know, for instance, I mean, this is really basic, but if we have a compliance role, you know, having a, an attention to detail assessment might be built into there along with a, a compliance and regulatory knowledge check. Um, doesn't mean that those become eliminators. It might mean that those become prescriptions for when someone starts, how do we build a talent development program for them? Say, so, hey, they were really, really good at this, but they had a knowledge gap around this particular area. How do we make sure we shore that up when they join the organization? So then the, uh, the talent assessor, hiring manager, and then the talent partner, again, their final job is to understand the market, understand the compensation, work with the OD team to finish up the job analysis and market data, and then they're responsible for kind of closing out the candidate. So the talent partner kind of pops in the beginning and the end of the process uh, with the sourcer, the talent assessor, and the hiring manager filling in the, kind of the meat of the sandwich. 
And so exactly. they're like a yeah. rover for you that is like constantly refining your hiring process and making it better. Exactly. Using data. Yep, which is the most important thing to do, <laughs> obviously. So yep. what's what's really interesting to me, and I hope everybody replays that like 10 times because I think that was a really good job at giving <laughs> a nice overview of a super refined process. And so I guess to recap a couple of things on that, as far as building a really strong talent pipeline, when you have to source candidates for an organization that is thousands and thousands of employees and growing really, really fast, you have to have a good mix of inbound and outbound strategies to source candidates. So like you said, you've got people that are dialing all day long, calling real estate agents, trying to get people interested on the outbound side. And then the inbound side, you're constantly looking at your job ads and your job descriptions and seeing how you can make them more effective to not only attract a good quantity of candidates, but also a good quality and a diverse set of candidates. Um, also sounds like on the screening side, you're using some video interviews, you're using assessments and doing a whole lot of things and touch points to make sure that the people you're advancing are going to be a quality fit for the organization. Um, and then also, I thought that was really interesting that you're almost identifying weaknesses of the candidates, even though you're still going to bring them on, because those are the opportunities for that person to grow once they're within the organization. Now, are you using that as like a selling point through the hiring process? Because I know like since I've known you at, at previous companies and at your current job, you've always been a big fan of promoting growth and promoting from within and making sure there's paths for people um, so they feel motivated not only during the hiring process but also once they come on board. So I'm curious if you're using those organizational development components that you built into the hiring process as a way to, like, attract people and get them excited about coming on board with you. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's, I'll be candid, more aspirational at this point, and, and I think sure. that's, by the way, it's okay for us to say that. Right. Um, you know, a lot of times people are, oh, I can't do all this because I don't have the next piece figured out. And you eventually put yourself into either apathy or, or paralysis by analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the big changes at AdCap, candidly, was 75 people. Here's 9,000 people. And, and I've been, <laughs> you know, at, at you know, 1,500-person company, so it's not it's a little different. big rodeo. But, uh, you know, with 9,000 people, I think it's a little more challenging. Uh, and, again, like I mentioned, the company grew so quickly that, you know, even getting job descriptions, job analysis done for all the positions. So we're still working in tandem through a lot of that. I think as that refines itself, and I think it's a really critical component, is to not only take internal candidates or as external candidates and push them through, but one of the things we're also doing in parallel related to that kind of topic is making a big push for internal uh, lateral and diagonal movement. And mm -hmm. so one of the ways we're doing that is also in the same way that the same exact way, frankly, that we're assessing the external talent, we're benchmarking that against internal talent and trying to capture additional data points in a substantive, tangible way and, and classify people with particular skill sets and hashtag them. So one of my objectives when I got here was that by 2019, I wanted 80% of my director plus promotions to be internal. Uh, just to give you a context, the, the industry benchmark, like 45% is like the top 99th percentile of the curve. Uh, so it's almost double what, what benchmark says. Uh, when I got here, it was about 15%. We're up to 40% so far. Uh, so in a less formalized way than I'd like it to be eventually, uh, we've really made a push for the internal talent pool being the first place that we look uh, and allowing that to drive some of our recruitment processes. So one of the nice things is when we're looking for talent and sourcing, again, you mentioned a lot of different ways that we're doing that, uh, you know, building a brand, pushing towards uh, you know, different uh, ways of looking at job descriptions, those that say come on in instead of stay on out, uh, you know, all of that. But it also means that, for instance, I'll, I'll give you a, a subtle version of that. For a lot of companies, the second place candidate normally goes into a dark black hole never to be heard from again. Well, we're tagging that second place candidate the same way we're tagging all of our internal employees, which allows us to then say, hey, you know, three months ago you were a top candidate, but, you know, we have a new role that, you know, you fit 80% of the search parameters for, and we've kept engaged with you through, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, just common communications or little updates or just little messages, et cetera. Uh, so we've kept in touch with them. We've driven the internal talent pool, so we're looking much more holistically than just kind of building a passive social talent pool, which is, you know, even the, the more progressive, that's kind of the, the tip of most progressive companies is just an internal or a social talent pool. We're actually driving internal talent assessment to be able to have a, a real-time example and a real-time opportunity to tap into our internal talent pool along with our second chance or third chance. Uh, you know, one of my favorite things that I've done 
is when I see an interesting resume across my desk, and I don't get to recruit quite as much in my, my current role, but uh, you know, as I was building out my team, and I, I joked when I was building the owners.com agent recruiting team, uh, you know, I got a call from my CEO, and he said, hey, Brad, we need you to build out this recruiting team to be able to hit this massive goal to uh, you know, take this company that's going to change real estate and you know, build out the real estate agent pool. I said, oh, great, that's wonderful, Bill. Uh, problem is I'm a little short-staffed on recruiters to hire these recruiters. He said, well, hire a recruiter. To... I said, well, okay, great, I need to hire a recruiter to hire these recruiters. Uh, he said, well, okay, well, I don't know what to tell you, Brad. I said, well, okay, I guess I'll be the recruiter to hire the recruiters to hire the recruiters. Uh, and so as I was building out my team and then hiring all these functions that we never really had uh, you know, on the U.S. side before, uh, I actually got to look at a lot of resumes. And, and one of my favorite things I used to do when I saw an interesting resume was send them a note and say, hey, you know, you're not a fit for the role that you applied for, but you have an interesting background. What do you like to do? You know, what, what are you looking for in terms of general compensation? And uh, let's see if there's something that might be able to fit on the team. And, and I've got some of my top, top performers on my team. Uh, in fact, one of the, the gentlemen just got promoted. He's working directly for the president of the Owners.com division. Uh, I hired him. He came in the door. Didn't know what the heck he actually could do for us, but uh, found out he might be a fit for something hardworking, you know, intelligent, passionate, humble, you know, all the attributes you'd really want in somebody. Uh, brought him on board. You know, hit a home run out of the park, luckily for me. And uh, so it's, it's being able to look at candidates, internal and external, through different lenses, I think that's really, really critical. Interesting. Yeah, I know always it's it's been a goal of yours to find those diamond in the rough candidates. I know that goes way back. That you've always always looked for those people that you know might not either jump out on paper, but they jump out on video or, or vice versa, and you're able to find those people and make them rock stars within the organization. So that's interesting that you've you've continued that at, at your current role. Now, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about what you said was you mentioned paralysis by by over analysis, right? Um, so people that are trying to build out a recruitment strategy, but maybe, you know, they don't have the resources or they don't have the time, just not everything's perfect. And so as a result, they don't end up putting things into place and then they don't get the results that they want. So I'm curious, like now you're at a company where you've got, you know, 100 plus person team, you've got all these resources, you're constantly refining processes. And on the outside, like, as I'm listening to you, I'm like, man, this process is, on point. It is perfect. Like everything about it is running like a well-oiled machine, but I imagine there's probably a whole lot of things that you still want to improve upon. So my question to you is, as people are listening and they're trying to build out their process and they're listening to all these things that you've got going on, it might seem a little overwhelming to them. Like, you know, I want to get this guy's results, but I, there's no way I have the time or resources to put all these processes in place. So for those people, is there like a specific place that you would tell them to start um, or something that you would tell them to focus on or not get you know, bogged down by as they're starting to build out their process and strategy to recruit top talent? Sure, that's a, that's a great question and one uh, that I think is important to calibrate. You know, and anyone who's seen me speak, I, I typically end all my presentations with this quote. Uh, and so apologies if you've heard me before, but I love the Chinese proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The <laughs> second best time is now. Uh, you know, the, the reality is it is never a good time. The best time is now. Uh, so you can keep waiting for the conditions to get better. They won't. Uh, and so finding, to me, the, the way that I've always began things like this, and the same way I started the process here, which, by the way, is, is hardly you know, oil refined. It's, it's every single day I'm finding something that could be a little little bit better or, or a tweak to the data algorithm uh, or a sourcing strategy. Man, on the agent recruiting team, we're running five different tests uh, in Q1 uh, with completely different strategies. You know, we, we ran a, a test uh, just a few weeks ago where instead of an interview, we just did a role play. Uh, that was the complete interview was just a role play with a real estate agent. Uh, and so, you know, we, we're experimenting with that. Early indicators actually show that, you know, we uh, have had a 27% increase in quality of hire just on that extremely small population. Uh, and it's different than, you know, the behavioral interviews, which frankly were measuring the same attributes that we had defined by doing kind of an internal survey, identifying what our top performers looked and felt like. So there's lots of tweaks always going on. Uh, the key is finding a group that will be receptive. Uh, ideally, if you have a high volume role, so for instance, we've got a role right now, we're hiring 40 people here in, you know, this month and next month, besides the agent side. And the agent side's hiring hundreds, if not a thousand here uh, over the next month, you know, couple months. But uh, on this other role on the corporate side, 
And again, we found a hiring manager that was really open to trying to look at things through a different lens. Uh, and then you had enough ver variability around the role to be able to say, you know, like if you're doing one role, for instance, I wouldn't recommend trying to do this talent assessment process on one role. Um, unless it's something really, really distinct, you have some really clear indicators, you feel like you can get some good benchmark data. Uh, whereas it's a lot easier to do it with 40 and figure out along the way where you make some mistakes. Uh, you know, my OT specialist that was on that particular role, they, they did the first version of the assessment. They did it multiple choice for the knowledge check. I've actually uh, used knowledge check for a number of years now. I don't like multiple choice. I think it gives them false negatives and false positives. And so I said, hey, guys, you know, let's pull back and not do multiple choice. They said, well, Brad, the first 40 candidates already took the multiple choice. You know, if we're going to use a, uh, you know, a, a solid benchmark across the entire population, you know, IO psychology says it needs to be consistent. And, you know, that's correct. Uh, at the same time, common sense says you need to actually do an assessment that's going to capture the right data. And sure. so in the midst of all of that, we made a, an executive decision, let's make sure that we do the right assessment versus continuing to do things that weren't necessarily as optimal. And so that's, you know, I think the key is just start. And in real time, you may find opportunities to make improvements. Uh, and, you know, I think finding somewhere that will let you fail. You know, one of the things I love about OKRs and why we're rolling them across the organization is that if you actually hit, I don't know if you're familiar with OKRs, Josh, uh, but you're actually supposed to fail at 30% of your OKRs. Uh, those are objective key results if you're not familiar with it. It's uh, kind of, you know, very Google's the ones who made it famous, although it goes back to Intel in the 70s, ironically. Uh, and so I love that spirit. Uh, in fact, it, it ended up backfiring on me, but I used to open up my recruiting team calls by having everyone go around the room and say what their biggest mistake or biggest failure from the previous week was. Uh, it, again, it was early in my tenure. The people didn't really understand the, the essence of what I was trying to get across, which is like, let's celebrate failure so long as we're learning from them. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend necessarily opening your calls with failures. It was, you know, it got me excited and got me pumped up thinking of opportunities to improve, but uh, it didn't necessarily have that effect on the team. But the sure. spirit of it is, is there, uh, which is just go uh, and know that, you know, you might mess up. And, uh, and, again, don't do it on the critical, you know, vice president role for, uh, you know, a growing business unit or, you know, it may not necessarily fit in one of your more conservative business units, uh, but just starting things. I mean, you know, Josh, you're familiar with my apprentice program. I ran at my last company. Yeah. Uh, got, you know, a lot of awards, a lot of recognition, a lot of speaking engagements around it. And, uh, you know, we started on the sales side. We did a sales apprenticeship. Then the engineering team looked over and said, hey, that's really cool. Can we do something like that? We started on the engineering side. I had one group that held out almost two years despite, you know, exponential massive success of the program. Finally, they sort of came and said, hey, okay, we'll do it too. They did it, and, you know, six months later, they can't believe that they never had done it before. And so it's okay if you don't necessarily have consistent rollout across the entire enterprise as long as you give opportunities for opting in and opting out to the program. Uh, so, again, I was more hesitant that I was going to be able to accomplish that type of scaled change at a 9,000-person company, uh, but I've been pleasantly surprised at the receptivity of a lot of our business units and trying things and, and always constantly looking at ways to improve and, and attract and retain the best talent possible. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, if you keep doing the same things, you're going to get the same results. So, ultimately, right. you've got to experiment, and like you said, it's better to experiment, you know, on a pilot group or a pilot position or some type of smaller sample and prove it. And if you can prove it, then you can start, you know, scaling it throughout the organization. So Absolutely. I guess the takeaway there is, like, don't be scared to get out of your comfort zone. Don't be scared to test things. If you fail, then, you know, fail on a smaller scale. Don't try it for every <laughs> sure. single position at the same time. Um, but if you fail, then use those learnings to, you know, either come up with a new experiment or shift gears or whatever it is. So, yeah. um, and, awesome. and it, you know, uh, one, one thing to think about too, is as I'm a big fan of minimal viable products, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times people think they have to build the whole thing out and before they can try it. Now, what's the most raw version possible of actually doing that? I mean, uh, that's, I think really, really a, a mistake. A lot of people make is thinking that it has to be much more mature and, and fleshed out. You know, what do you need to do to actually see how are people going to interact with the experience? Uh, you know, what are the things that you couldn't think of in advance? Because if you try to think of everything, you won't, and then you'll find yourself wasting a lot of time going back and correcting what you thought was the right thing all along. So yep. minimal viable product around any, any process, frankly, you do is, uh, I think, a, a critical innovation driver. Yeah, and I think, 
you know, a lot of people can relate to that. So, you know, like if you're a CEO or a founder that's listening to this and you come from a marketing background or a product background, um, you know, you're probably familiar with MVPs and, and experiments. So, you know, it's something that you can definitely apply to your recruiting. So I think that's a, that's a really awesome takeaway. So yeah. that's, that's a lot of really good content for the audience. <laughs> um, that's a lot for them to take in and digest. But I think, you know, if you could just pull away a few nuggets from there, you know, people will be really on their way and very satisfied with some of the action items that they could take away from the podcast. So before we wrap up, one of the things that I like to do is just on a personal level, ask people some things that, you know, maybe our audience can take away and it's, it's not as um, much on the work side of things. So are you reading any book right now or that you would recommend to the audience? Yeah. So the, um, the book I'm in the middle of right now is the startup way by Eric Reese, uh, who wrote lean, uh, it's a lean startup. Uh, yep. So startup is how do you take lean startup principles and apply them to big, slow-moving machines? Uh, so you know, it talks about the government with healthcare.gov and GE. Uh, so I, I find it to be a you know really interesting way of just kind of how do you treat different pieces and then teach organizations how to move at, at different speeds. Uh, next up in my queue, sitting on my desk, ready to be read, is just, just came up, hot up the pressures, so I can't comment on it, but the talent delusion. Uh, okay. Why data, not intuition, is the key to unlocking human potential. Uh, I think that just came out about even a month ago or two months ago, I think. Let's see. Uh, yep, 2017. And so that was uh, there. And then uh, the book I've been handing out, I've been handing out quite a few books this year. Uh, the one that I've been handing out the most probably is called Exponential Organization. Uh, and uh, essentially it's this idea of how do you create things that grow exponentially versus linearly. Uh, and so obviously, you know, Uber is a great example of, of that and Waze. Uh, you know, I love the Waze story. Waze, actually, if you're not familiar with it, uh, essentially with very little capital investment, grew so quickly uh, with free social content. Uh, you know, Waze is 100% user content driven. And so, you know, how do you create those type of things, uh, those type of engagement communities uh, around products, around processes, around ideation? Uh, so exponential organization to me has been a really cool way uh, to challenge people how to think uh, exponentially versus linearly around their problem. And there's some really great stories in there that you can read. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's funny. As, as you were talking about your recruiting process, I was thinking of the book, The Lean Startup, because I feel like a lot of things <laughs> you're doing apply a lot of principles from that book. So it's, it's interesting that you're reading some of his other work. So um, what about any productivity tools that you're using? Maybe, you know, they don't necessarily have to be related to recruiting or HR, but is there anything that, you know, really helps you be super productive throughout the day? Sure. Uh, in the uh, probably just hard work. Is <laughs> it you know, the tool or not? Uh, you know the the the, the funny thing, and uh, hard work is a, a very controversial topic. Uh, and what I've always joked is, at the end of the day, if you think about 10,000 hours, if I'm averaging an 80-hour work week, uh, and I'm 15 years or so into my career, that means I'm really 30 years into my career compared to someone who's putting in a 40-hour work week. And so, sure. to me, just just hard work is probably the most underrated uh, piece. And that being said, you know, balance and, and turning off, uh, especially since getting married a couple of years ago. Uh, and shout out to my wife Marissa, uh, who I love very much. Uh, so she, she has to put up with me. But you know, we've been shutting down. So like this year we went to Hawaii and, and shut off, you know, didn't bring my computer or my phone for a week. And so ironically, I think that's actually a productivity tool. You know, it's the absence of, of tools becomes sure. the productivity tool. The, uh, the other cool thing that I've been using for a couple of years uh, is uh, Pure Chat. And uh, there's a million versions of it. So I probably gave an you know, un unintended free uh, sponsorship opportunity for them. But uh, I've always loved Instant Chat uh, for my recruiting pages, for all of our kind of careers pages, uh, mm -hmm. where someone, a candidate, can actually chat with you in real time. And, uh, you know, most company websites, and they don't say it quite as badly anymore, but no phone calls, no emails, please. You know, don't call us, we'll call you. And uh, what I loved about Instant Chat, I was like, no, talk to someone right now in real time. Let's answer your questions. Let's engage, you know, on your mobile, on your you know, PC, on your tablet. Uh, so I've always kind of, again, similar to the job postings, liked the idea of, hey, let's get people in. Let's figure out where they could or couldn't fit and then take it from there. And so uh, kind of Instant Chat features have been uh, a big fan of mine. Nice, nice. Cool. And then just one more question. So any favorite recruiting influencer, like somebody whose blog you read, podcast you listen to, videos you watch, somebody that you think our audience should follow? You know, and I, and I wish I could tell you that, but I actually, I'm, I'm a fan of pattern recognition. And uh, to me, 
I actually like to go as far outside of the industry as possible. Uh, and so, I mean, even reading the startup way, I mean, to, to me, there's a million applications of the startup way or lean startup to what we do. And so, you know, most of my, uh, on the way in, I'll, I'll tell you, kind of this is a, a non-answer again, which I have a tendency to do sometimes. You know, my, my pattern every day is, is really, really easy. It's Every morning, I read Flipboard. So if you're not familiar, Flipboard's a nice app that lets you kind of aggregate content across different con- you know, different sources. And so it's it's keyed into business or finance or, or marketing. You know, we can use A/B testing. We do a lot of the marketing principles, like you alluded to. Uh, so I read that first thing when I pop out of bed in the morning. And uh, then on the way into work, I typically listen to a podcast. Uh, you know, HBR is probably one of my favorites, uh, although there's a couple of the ones, Inc., et cetera, that you know, put out good content, not necessarily about recruiting or HR, but, you know, general more business. And then, you know, if a certain particular function in the business is doing something, why can't we do it in our group, uh, which ends up making our HR department feel more like one of the business units in an operation because at the end of the day, our job is to recruit, retain, and maximize revenue. I mean, that's – HR, I mean, you could, it could add, mitigate risk into there if you really wanted to add a fourth R, but that's really what we do, uh, and that's what the businesses need to do. And so really focusing on business needs to, to create business solutions uh, has really been a big piece. And then before I go to bed is where I typically do the, the old-fashioned paper book, and I'll read a chapter to bed. So the idea is I think I dream about you know, HR or work stuff at night, wake up, I get my brain thinking about it right away while I'm brushing my teeth rather than kind of idle thought and uh, come into the work. The one twist on all that is on the way home, I typically listen to Around the Horn, uh, the ESPN show, uh, to kind of tune down work a little bit and, and turn off so I can spend some time with my wife and, and not be thinking about work all the time. Exactly. It's your cool, it's your cool down stage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Awesome. Well, Brad, this has been great. I think you've you know really provided some awesome advice for the audience. If everybody wants to connect with you, should they hit you up on LinkedIn or where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, LinkedIn is the, is the best way to reach me. Uh, you know, you can add me. Know that it takes me a little bit of time to clean up my network. Uh, I've been on LinkedIn for pretty much the beginning of time, so I've got 30,000 first-degree connections over there. Uh, and so I have to delete connections <laughs> to, to add them. But that's typically the best way. Or you can email me. Uh, my email at, at works, just my first initial, B. Wilkins, my last name, W-I-L-K-I-N-S, at altasource.com. Uh, again, anything I can do to help out. Uh, and to me, I, I think the better that the general recruiting or HR or business community comes at, at treating people and evaluating people and giving people opportunities, I think it helps all of us. Uh, I used to provide our playbook to all my competitors at my previous company, and uh, I found that to be an effective way of increasing the talent pool across the entire geographic area, or in this case now the world. So I'm a big fan of, of trying to pay it forward as much as possible, and I uh, would be glad to answer any additional questions if I talk too fast or you wanted to deep dive into some stuff. You know, my uh, my resources are yours. Awesome. Well, Brad, thank you so much for coming on today, and appreciate your time. We hope you found this episode impactful, and would like to invite you to discover even more resources on our website at sparkhire.com/resources. Our library of HDR and recruiting content, complete with webinars, ebooks, courses, and our popular video series, The Recruiting Reel, will have you ready to take on any recruiting challenge. You can find all this and more at sparkhire.com resources. Until next time, keep retention high and growth happening.